So good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you um, to the Friday Morning Thyroid Journal Club. Um, I'd like to uh, first thank everybody for joining us. And secondly, um, a special thanks to Dr. Tufano and Dr. Amy Chen. Um, Dr. Tufano will be discussing the article that we had um, sent out for this morning. He is the Charles Cumming Endowed Professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is Director of the Division of Head and Neck Endocrine Surgery. He's an internationally renowned um, expert in the field. Um, and um, the discussant today is Dr. Amy Chen, who is the William and Lillian Hackerman Professor and Vice Chair for Faculty Development in the Department of Otolaryngology Head Neck Surgery at Emory University School of Medicine, also both nationally and internationally renowned for expertise in um, endocrine surgery. And so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tufano um, and uh, Ralph, it's all, all you, thank you. Thanks, Mark. And thank you everybody for attending the webinar. I want to say, uh, the THANK organization does fantastic work and all of the staff has been very, very helpful. Mark, I wanted to let you know, I've uh, now known you for 25 years as of this month, and I am still amazed by all the exceptional work you do for all our patients in the field, so thank you. Uh, today, we're gonna cover the article, Ultrasound Guided Radiofrequency Ablation Versus Surgery for Low-Risk Papillary Thyroid Microcarcinoma results of over five years follow-up. And this is with colleagues that I've worked with at the People's Liberation Army Hospital in Beijing, China. And you can see them all listed on this page. Uh, my slides are not advancing. Let's see if I can do that. Stella, I'm not able to advance my slides. There we go, okay. So I have some disclosures uh, you can see here. Let's get to the case presentation. This is a 32-year-old female presented to the thyroid center for a second opinion on a single incidentally found thyroid nodule in the left thyroid lobe. The nodule was a solid hypoechoic mass measuring six millimeters in its largest dimension that presented with irregular margins and microcalcifications. No suspicious lymph nodes were observed. The patient insisted on getting an FNA biopsy, which revealed a Bethesda 6 lesion. She had no significant family history of thyroid cancer and no exposure to radiation. So what is your first choice in treatment? And you can see A is active surveillance, B is lobectomy alone, C is lobectomy with possible total thyroidectomy if adverse features are identified at the time of surgery, D is total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection, and E is ultrasound guided radiofrequency ablation. The outline for my talk will be uh, the following. I will cover the basics of RFA because I think you need to understand RFA before we can start talking about applying it to treating a thyroid cancer and in particular, a papillary microcarcinoma. I'll discuss a little bit about the RFA technique so it makes sense to everybody and you can see what's available. And then of course, I'll discuss the study. I think that this a slide here says it all. In our field, we really have to talk amongst all of the stakeholders to make and help to make the patient make the value-based decision that is best for them. This is critical, especially when there isn't hard and fast evidence to hit you over the head and say, you absolutely must do this or that. So the value proposition for the patient, they have to come to realize that and we need to help them with that. I also would say that we have a need to familiarize ourselves with all treatment options, even if you don't perform them. We have an ethical responsibility to our patients, a professional responsibility, and we also need to keep current with our evolving technologies. We have a responsibility to ourselves. Critical evaluation to avoid a personal or subjective bias, and especially to avoid paternalism. That's very important in helping patients to make a fair value-based decision. 
How do you get started with radiofrequency ablation? This is kind of new, right? I mean, surgery is surgery, but for radiofrequency ablation especially, this is a new technique that may be unfamiliar to some of the stakeholders who care for patients. Maybe even some endocrinologists who don't perform their own fine needle aspiration biopsy or interventional procedures. Well, I think just like anything else, you read the literature, this is what you do, you know, you're in this field and you understand the ATA guidelines and you understand the relevant RFA studies and guidelines. But at the core of this really is learning ultrasound, hands-on ultrasound, you doing it yourself of the thyroid and parathyroid glands. You have to be facile with fine needle aspiration biopsy techniques. And I think that that's critical before endeavoring with RFA. You also will figure out that ultrasound provides invaluable information with regard to your procedure, whether it's surgery or RFA. What is the relationship of the index nodule that you're going to treat, considering the different treatment options, right? So if I have a lesion that is sitting at the posterior capsule medially up against a tracheoesophageal groove, that might not be a good patient for either active surveillance or RFA. But if I had a nodule that was def definitely intraparenchymal, surrounded by normal thyroid tissue in the mid to inferior lobe, well, that may be an ideal candidate for RFA. So location, location, location is critical and not every six millimeter papillary microcancer is the same. So what we need to understand is that of course, our ATA guidelines help us, and we probably should not be biopsying any nodules that are less than a centimeter, regardless of the ultrasound characteristics, but the real world is that we do, and some of our patients demand it, just like in the case presentation. So what to do? Well, I think that the current literature is now being populated with RFA series. And so there are some series and strategies for successful radiofrequency ablation of benign thyroid nodules. And the first report of using RFA for papillary microcancer was from the Zhang group at the PLA hospital. That was published in 2016, and that was their initial series. For me though, the real wake up call was the 2017 thyroid radiofrequency ablation guidelines. This was from the Korean Society of Thyroid Radiology. And what I realized is that disruptive technology, this was disruptive technology, and there were significant implications for us in the United States, that these ultrasound directed therapies will evolve and they'll be refined that active surveillance and surgery will both become less desirable for papillary microcancers. In fact, I would submit to you that active surveillance only exists because surgery is such an extreme sort of option sometimes, and maybe there's not always the expertise to render that surgery as safely as possible. Most benign thyroid nodules and small cytologically indeterminate nodules and thyroid cancer will come to ablation. So if our attention is only toward these fancy surgeries or remote access approaches, I think we'll come to suffer the same fate as the dinosaurs. I think surgeons, endocrinologists, radiologists, all must be facile with ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, biopsy, and directed therapy skills to remain relevant in all aspects of thyroid nodule and cancer care. And we realized that pretty early and began a prospective study using RFA for benign nodules at Hopkins starting in July of 2019. I would ask you to consider how many times in your clinic, when you're seeing a patient, you've been asked, can't you just remove the nodule? Well, now you can. You can treat the nodule alone with radiofrequency ablation. So radiofrequency ablation, everybody knows the general concept of what radiofrequency does, right? So it allows you to disturb the tissue enough so that you're heating it and boiling it and causing a thermal injury. The technique is called a moving shot technique because what you're doing is under ultrasound, you're waiting for the changes in the thyroid parenchyma to be demonstrated, sort of a micro bumbling of the tissue so that once you see that, you're going to move your needle and continue to create these thermal injuries in a very systematic fashion. It's a three-dimensional aspect to the treatment. Certainly you wanna be very systematic for comprehensive ablation, even if you're doing a benign nodule, 
So you may start out posterior and you should, because if you go anteriorly, your ultrasound will be confounded, right? The transmission of the sound waves will be disturbed if you're treating the anterior aspect of the nodule before the posterior aspect. And this is critical to learn these techniques. We do an approach where we go through the isthmus. <clears throat> this allows for stability, especially because these patients are not asleep. They're under local anesthesia. It also prevents the back leakage of this hot liquid in and around the surrounding tissue, and there's clear and definable anatomic landmarks. We don't do an approach laterally. We never do an approach laterally, especially for the benign nodules. This is always transismic, and for the most part, it's always going to be the same way for papillary microcancer. We are also very aware that we have to make sure that we're gonna create this injury in a systematic fashion, and we're very mindful of the important structures in this area. And this is a bit of an over demonstration because we never have to fully come out with the needle, but you can see that we're having to be very systematic. We call these little triangles the danger triangles. And as I just told you before, if we have a tumor that is sitting at the posterior medial capsule, next to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, for example, how are we gonna get a margin to treat that cancer? That may not be an ideal cancer for radiofrequency ablation. And of course, we use the same criteria for active surveillance because progression in this area could cause significant consequences and recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement. And then you would have lost a chance to control this tumor without causing that morbidity. So again, location, 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 critical. And your ultrasound is so powerful in helping to determine that. So how do you select the right patients? Let's talk about benign nodules. Well, benign nodules that are causing symptoms that demonstrate growth on ultrasound, why wait? If, especially if you have a young patient who has a nodule that is 2.5 centimeters one year, yeah, asymptomatic, now is almost four, two years later, and so you know eventually it's gonna become symptomatic. This is a perfect patient uh, population to treat. Motivated patient, especially if it's a large nodule, if they're going to need additional treatments. There are many training opportunities all over the world. Of course, with COVID, things have changed considerably, but it's important to understand that these training opportunities are gonna become more and more uh, available, especially here within the United States, as we endeavor too to have our first virtual course, hopefully at the end of June. So let me just cover some of the great people that I've met in China and this group in particular. I met Dr. Zhang, who you can see here to your left as you're visualizing the screen next to the Great Wall. I've met her at one of the American Thyroid Association meetings after she gave her presentation on that initial series that I spoke to you about before. She is very bright, very eloquent, and I was fascinated with the work they were doing over there. So I said, I have to go over and visit. And Dr. Liu over there on the right is the real uh, master of it all. And she is the director of all of the efforts and very, very um, wonderful to work with. So let's go over the study. And again, the purpose was to compare radiofrequency ablation versus thyroidectomy in treating these low-risk papillary thyroid microcarcinomas. The outcomes to be assessed, looking at effic efficacy, the oncologic outcomes, quality of life, complications, and costs over a five-year follow-up period. The study was performed from January of 2013 to November of 2013. There were 174 consecutive patients who ultimately ended up in the study with solitary intrathyroidal papillary microcancers. 94 were for RFA and 80 had surgery, 58 for lobectomy, 22 for total thyroidectomy, and 53 underwent a lymph node dissection. Now, I would remind you that our practices all over the world are very different. This was a decision for the surgeon to make with the patient about extent of surgery. All of these patients, they did not have any evidence of suspicious lymph nodes on ultrasound, but you can see a common practice in China, especially even when just doing a lobectomy, is to perform a routine ipsilateral central neck dissection. The pre and post treatment variables to consider, 
demographics, tumor characteristics, the treatment, local tumor progression, if that was seen, lymph node metastases, if they developed distant metastases as well, local recurrence, complications, and quality of life. So the RFA group, these were again, solitary, suspicious, sub-centimeter thyroid nodule detected by ultrasound. There was no evidence of any extrathyroidal extension. And I would say it's very difficult on ultrasound to determine microscopic extrathyroidal extension. But as you know, by reading the literature, that really does not have any effect on recurrence rates or survival. There's no evidence of lymph node metastases or distant metastases. They have a routine of performing core needle biopsy. And so that confirmed papillary thyroid cancer, and they think it helps with subtyping the papillary thyroid cancer to make sure they're not going to treat with, uh, with radiofrequency a more aggressive subtype of papillary thyroid cancer. Please remember that active surveillance was not an option during the study period, right? So this is 2013. This predates the ATA guidelines, which came out in 2015, the newest version that included active surveillance. And certainly the Chinese guidelines at the time did not have active surveillance as an option. So the patients chose either surgery or radiofrequency ablation. And if they refused surgery or were ineligible for surgery, then they underwent radiofrequency ablation. The surgery group criteria, these were included retrospectively after surgery. They were solitary suspicious subcentimeter nodules on ultrasound. And again, 74 out of 80 underwent a core needle biopsy. Six patients elected to just have a surgery based on the suspicious findings alone. They were confirmed to have papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. They did not want a biopsy. There was no extrathyroidal extension, lymph node metastases, or distant metastases. The RFA treatment method is done with local anesthesia. You just inject lidocaine subcutaneously in and around the thyroid capsule. They use a drug that we don't have available, which is a uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound with an agent that they're able to inject intravenously. I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but remember this is a radiology group who is very comfortable with contrast enhanced ultrasound and they feel that it does add a little bit to their technique as being more confident about the ablation zone. But again, remember that most ablation done throughout the world is really done just by looking at the pattern of ablation and the creation of the microbubbles and the change in the parenchyma within the treated nodule. They endeavor to get three millimeter margins around the nodule. So you could see that most of these were gonna be either intrathyroidal or away from that danger zone, at least that we spoke about. The moving shot technique that I demonstrated to you was employed and none of their patients had TSH suppression. So that's very important to know. If there was a critical structure, very, very adjacent or intimately involving what they thought was the thyroid capsule or the nodule capsule, I should say, they do have these hydro dissection techniques. And we do the same thing with uh, benign tumors is that they can inject dextrose or even saline and you can create an aqueous medium in that area and, and, and to, to provide a barrier uh, and also to uh, allow for a heat sink so that the heat doesn't necessarily come uh, up against those important critical structures. And this is a little bit more of an art form that you kind of establish over time, but it is quite successful as you advance your practice and the complexity or difficulty of your treatment uh, candidates. Surgeries, these were all open. So we're not talking about any remote access approaches, novel approaches, transoral. These are all transcervical surgeries. I already spoke about the decision for the extent of surgery. And in this group, all of them at least underwent TSH suppression to make sure that their TSH was in the range of 0.5 to 2. 
at the five years of follow-up, RFA, well, ultrasound was done at one, three, and then six months for five years. And the effectiveness of the RFA was the uh, equal to the absence of contrast enhancement on ultrasound. So again, they use contrast enhanced ultrasound, a technique that not many of us are familiar with here in the United States. Surgery, the ultrasound was every six months for five years. Local tumor progression was defined by one, new or persistent detected lesions confirmed by biopsy, two, cervical lymph nodes confirmed by biopsy, and then also the THICA quality of life questionnaire was utilized to assess quality of life. There were no differences between the two groups with respect to demographics. The mean tumor diameter for both groups was about six millimeters. Surgery took longer, of course. RFA is usually a very quick procedure. Even with large benign nodules, we don't find ourselves taking more than about 30 to 45 minutes to ablate that nodule with not much prep time and certainly not waiting for the patient to be extubated, for example, from anesthesia. There was more blood loss with surgery, a longer hospitalization time, and please remember that in China, most of these patients, even still to this day, if you're undergoing a lobectomy, will at least spend one, if not two nights in the hospital, where of course in the United States, we've moved toward outpatient surgery as much as we can when it's safe. There were also higher treatment costs. In the surgery group, two patients had permanent vocal fold paralysis. Now, I want to remind you, I know both of these surgeons there at China PLA Hospital. These are very experienced surgeons. They do thousands of thyroid surgeries a year, not hundreds like some of us do, but thousands. And even in that situation, there were two patients who had permanent vocal fold paralysis one with a complete transection of a nerve, the other one that was heated by one of the surgical instruments and never returned with function. One permanent hypoparathyroidism and one patient had a new lesion in a contralateral lobe. Okay, well, they can't be held responsible for that, but you know that's why they're followed with ultrasound. Radiofrequency group, one patient had a new lesion arise in the ipsilateral lobe. Again, I don't think that that could be faulted because lesions are going to develop in the remaining parenchyma. It is quite possible. And the patient has to understand that with radiofrequency. No complications whatsoever. And the quality of life scores were statistically significantly better in nine out of 13 categories. There was less treatment cost because let's face it, OR time is expensive. Anesthesia time is expensive. So surgery in the OR is just more expensive and it was proven to be not inferior oncologically. The study limitations, of course, it's five years follow-up. That's pretty good, but this is a very sort of indolent disease, right? So we need to follow these patients even longer to truly understand the effects of our treatment. Eight pa 18 patients were lost to follow-up before the five years, so that is another limitation. These were non-randomized, and active surveillance was not included as an option for quality of life. And that's important to make sure we really have an understanding of how our patients make decisions about treatment and the value proposition. Because active surveillance may still be appealing to patients even if RFA were available. And then of course, operator dependency for RFA and surgery. And that's where our, you know, when we talk about active surveillance and especially you hear some of the big proponents of active surveillance, especially in the United States, you realize it's because if you get told you have thyroid cancer, you may seek help from a surgeon who does probably five or less thyroids a year because the majority of thyroid surgery done in the United States is done by thyroid surgeons who do less than five cases per year, and then maybe you're gonna get hurt. So maybe it's okay to wait until you really need surgery and you can find a surgeon who does this all the time to minimize the risk. I don't know about that. It doesn't seem like a very, very appropriate scheme. Nonetheless, I think RFA and directed therapies are here to stay and they will continue to evolve. And I think RFA provides a nice happy medium for those with papillary microcancers who don't want surgery, but yet are too anxious to pursue active surveillance. And I can tell you that 
what I'm most impressed with is that some people say, well, okay, papillary microcancers like prostate cancer. And I said, boy, wow, what a complete miss. How could you say that? The demographic, it's completely different. Prostate cancer, yeah, men. Papillary microcancer, mostly women. And we know that women make decisions differently than men. And I don't want to uh, say anything bad about my um, gender, but women are very thoughtful about taking care of others and not necessarily themselves. So when you're faced with a prostate surgery that could affect your overall performance sexually, you may have reservations <laughs> about doing that surgery. But women, we know from the breast cancer literature, when they're faced with a breast cancer in just one breast, they're often thinking about and will go toward a bilateral mastectomy. I think women think very differently about cancer than men, and they are caretakers, and they're worried about being around to take care of others. Active surveillance may not be a good option for those patients and that demographic. So RFA, I think, would provide a nice middle ground here. Thank you for your time and listening to the presentation that I put forward today. Great, thanks, Ralph. Um, Amy, if you could uh, uh, move forward with a discussion. Okay, um, let me share my slides. All right. Okay, so um, thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting me, and thank you for all the participants for your attention, and thank you, Ralph, for your presentation. And so I'm going to uh, uh, give a kind of point counterpoint to what Ralph has discussed already. I'm going to talk a little bit about active surveillance, but in general, we already know the study design of what um, Dr. Chifano's study showed. Uh, the study limitation. I think uh, he's already gone over a little bit, but I wanted to talk a little bit about it as well. This did come from a single institution, and therefore there are concerns about lack of generalizability from the uh, information that was um, uh, presented. Uh, the, uh, the study uh, was performed mostly by a very highly skilled ultrasonographer with uh, radio frequency ablation experience. Um, that may not be generalizable at this time to much of our uh, practice population in the United States. And uh, therefore, I, I have some concerns about that. And also, there was no option for active surveillance at uh, the time the study was performed. So I think it's important to talk about active surveillance and what it is. And this is a table of the uh, guidelines put forward by the American Thyroid Association in 06, 09, and then 2015. And as you can see in this bottom row, active surveillance wasn't on the table for the past two guidelines. It was only placed uh, in the guidelines in 2015. It was for very low risk tumors, so less than one centimeter, and also for those who are not a good surgical candidate. So why should we even pursue active surveillance and how did this come to be? Well, I think that there have been some studies that, that demonstrated oncologic soundness, and there is a patient preference for scarless surgery um, in terms of not having any scar, not having any intervention. I think that the, um, the point that Ralph made about gender differences and how uh, women and men manage their uh, health is an important one. However, I do think that women um, and men may not have that many differences regarding having a scar or not. And so I think that that is something that has driven a lot of innovation in terms of approaches to the uh, organ from different areas and also um, trying to figure out if we don't need to do surgery at all. And there is also a lot of uh, literature right now looking at how these are clinically insignificant cancers in that it doesn't impact mortality. Um, we've learned this from the South Korean experience with this overdiagnosis of cancer. Uh, however, um, the death rates are essentially unchanged. So what this means is, and this is what the SEER data demonstrates too, so we can see the rate of new cases of thyroid cancer 
has really um, increased quite a bit, but the mortality rate has remained stable. And what this means is that perhaps we're uh, overdiagnosing some of these cancers. When you have a fast growing cancer and you catch it, then you can actually decrease the mortality rate. So for example, with lung cancer, we've made a lot of progress in um, uh, screening and uh, colon cancer as well in screening and therefore the mortality rates have dropped. But whenever we detect a lot of thyroid cancer, we're not really seeing a decrease in mortality rates, which suggests that there is some overdiagnosis occurring and therefore the clinically quote unquote insignificant cancers are the ones that are being diagnosed. So other uh, data to support this is that autopsy studies have demonstrated latent small thyroid cancers. Um, screening studies have been performed that demonstrate similar rates of latent small thyroid cancers between those who've been screened and those who haven't. And uh, most importantly, there was a prospective trial done at Kuma Hospital and Cancer Institute Hospital in Japan, which uh, is this observational trial. So Dr. Miyauchi, um, determined that with the uh, insignificant, um, clinically insignificant thyroid cancers, perhaps we should look and see if there really is a difference. So from 93 to 2004, patients with sub-centimeter papillary thyroid cancer diagnosed by ultrasound-guided fine needle biopsy were offered observation versus surgery. So it's important to note that this was not a prospective randomized trial, but it was a uh, patient's choice. And obviously that creates some selection bias. So observation was defined as every six to 12 months ultrasound. If there was growth, then surgery was offered. Um, about 340 patients underwent observation. A third of them subsequently had surgery. 1,055 people underwent immediate surgery. And the important thing was that there was no detriment in oncologic soundness uh, in the delayed surgery in the observation group. So basically people did the same, regardless of whether you decided to do observation or surgery. Um, and these are some of the findings and observation of the low-risk uh, papillary microcarcinoma at Kuma Hospital. Uh, the, interestingly, the, uh, the microcarcinoma of young patients were more likely to progress, and uh, he has had sub subsequent papers that have demonstrated this. Um, in Japan, the medical cost of observation was lower than that of immediate surgery, so if we're talking about cost observation might be the better option um, economically. And uh, also that those who underwent surgery after a period of active surveillance did not show any adverse features or did not lose any time or did not um, sacrifice any oncologic soundness by delaying their surgery. Similarly, in Cancer Institute, the hospital, very slow, uh, very low uh, proportion of people under uh, had size enlargement. Um, and uh, none of the patients who underwent surgery after the detection of progression showed any uh, worse outcomes. So this is the body of work that supports active surveillance. However, there are some contraindications to active surveillance. Uh, those that have uh, clinically high-risk features, uh, of course, whenever we decide whether to do active surveillance, RFA, or surgery, I think a High resolution ultrasound is very important, and I echo what Ralph said about how uh, surgeons and endocrinologists who care for thyroid patients should really have a good command of ultrasound, um, ideally in their own hands, or at least with a partner who is uh, interested and motivated to look at things that, that you as a treating physician or treating clinician are interested in. So obviously, if there's nodal disease, you don't want to move forward with active surveillance or if there's metastatic disease, if there are signs or symptoms of invasion to the recurrent laryngeal nerve or trachea, this is the same thing as what Ralph said about location, 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 where this papillary microcarcinoma is in the thyroid is, is extremely important to decision-making about subsequent treatment. High-grade malignancy is more difficult to detect in the U.S. because we don't routinely do core biopsies on our thyroid nodules. However, if you did do a core biopsy and you did find, for example, tall cell variant, you may, uh, I don't think it would be a good idea to do active surveillance. Uh, and obviously those that are showing progression um, of uh, the size of the nodule or lymph node metastasis, you should take them off the active surveillance and go to surgery. Um, so in terms of the location, this paper argues that perhaps um, they should not be observed 
However, it's sometimes difficult to tell on imaging and therefore uh, this is some uh, soft uh, features that may not be a good uh, indication for surveillance. So I think that um, I'm just going to pose some uh, different scenarios. Um, why should we do active surveillance over RFA? Well, I think the number one reason would be that technical mastery of RFA is not widely available. And in fact, it's only uh, being instituted for benign thyroid nodules in, uh, in some centers in the US. Uh, very few centers, as, as far as I know, are offering RFA for papillary microcarcinomas. Uh, the other thing is that there's a relative ease of active surveillance. You just do an ultrasound, you have the patients come back, you don't need to be highly skilled in RFA. Yes, you do need to have a skilled ultrasonographer, but I think that's much more readily available than someone who has technical mastery of RFA. And there's a potential for complication with RFA. Even if we're not doing surgery on the patients, there is a potential for vocal fold paralysis due to the heat of the um, RFA. Uh, uh, on the thyroid itself. And again, why should we even touch these cancers? They're clinically insignificant. We've demonstrated epidemiologically that they do not really impact the mortality rate. And therefore, perhaps we should just be watching them and not uh, uh, putting something into it or doing some sort of intervention. But really, what we're really trying to figure out is, you know, we're trying to tell the patient, okay, it's nothing serious, but let's keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't turn into a major lawsuit. I mean, yes, that is always in the back of our minds when we practice medicine in the United States. And therefore, I think it is important to look at other uh, options besides active surveillance for these papillary microcarcinomas. So one thing is what uh, Ralph, has already, Ralph and his authors have already proposed, RFA. You know, there is anxiety about it. The genie's out of the bottle now. We've already biopsied it. You know you have cancer. What are you gonna do about it? And for many individuals, it's a, oh man, now that I know what it is, am I gonna be able to live with it? And certainly there is a lot of anxiety. Now, whether there are gender differences in this level of anxiety, I don't think I know the answer to that. That would be an interesting study to look at to see if patient preferences regarding treatment for papillary microcarcinomas differ based on gender. Uh, but there is also a concern for loss to follow up for active surveillance. So as uh, Dr. Erka mentioned, I practice in Atlanta, Georgia. We have a lot of CDC um, uh, uh, patients who are from the CDC or work in the CDC who get uh, deployed to Africa and other continents. They're gone for long, long periods of time and it would be uh, impossible to do active surveillance. And telemedicine, as far as I know, isn't really available internationally, and I really can't do an ultrasound via telemedicine. So I think that, you know, for example, that is one group of patients uh, that is gonna be very difficult for active surveillance. Secondly, the other way we lose is from people who lose their employment. And during this COVID pandemic, we have nearly 40 million people who are uh, applying for unemployment benefits. Therefore, most likely there's 40 million people who are um, at risk of losing their health insurance. And if people lose their health insurance, they may not be able to keep up with active surveillance. So it might be a good idea just to have a procedure, be one and done, and treat the cancer and the patient can uh, carry on with his or her life. Why RFA over surgery? Well, um, as uh, Ralph has mentioned, uh, there, it takes less time, uh, there are fewer complications. We are uh, achieving equivalent oncologic results. There's no surgical incision or scar and there's lower cost. Uh, but why surgery over RFA? Um, and perhaps that's another uh, thing that one should consider. Instead of just doing active surveillance, we should be doing something. So should we do RFA or should we do surgery? Surgery uh, proponents may, uh, may say, well, you know, if you did the RFA and then it, something happens and there's not a whole, there's not a complete resolution of the tumor or it grows on the other side or they develop a lymph node later, what sort of scarring can occur in that bed that has been uh, treated with RFA? Um, so therefore, maybe we should just do surgery and do a clean uh, uh, takeout and we can look at central lymph nodes and, and do everything like that. But 
I think that I would submit that with high resolution ultrasound, you can get a pretty good idea of central lymph nodes. And as Ralph already said, micrometastasis in lymph nodes from uh, thyroid cancer is very prevalent and very common. However, it's unclear and most likely has no impact on uh, recurrence or survival. So in terms of costs, um, I just wanted to point out, Dr. Tufana did publish on this in 2016, comparing thyroidectomy versus active surveillance. One of the uh, arguments for doing active surveillance was less cost, but in this paper, uh, Dr. Tufano reports that perhaps we're not really saving that much money with active surveillance, because in those cases that proceeded to surgery act active, after active surveillance, there's actually a considerable cost that was pretty much the same as what would have happened if you had upfront surgery. Now, it would be interesting to see uh, comparing RFA versus active surveillance versus surgery uh, for um, my papillary microcarcinomas and seeing how the costs may differ. So this paper just recently came out in thyroid um, evaluating three different types of thermal ablation techniques. What Dr. Tufano described is only one way that you can heat a tumor up. You can use laser and you can use microwave as well. I think the radio frequency ablation is the most direct and the most uh, uh, targeted way. Uh, we have experience with that in the liver for uh, metastatic disease in the liver. And so therefore, I think the translation to the neck um, using the instruments that are available is uh, much more easy. So this paper um, looked at uh, a bunch of, uh, started out with 105 papers, excluded many, and then ended up with 11 to compare these um, uh, the safety and efficacy of thermal ablation for papillary microcarcinomas. There are the, based on this meta-analysis, the overall complication rate was about 3%. Uh, there is quite a range in the uh, confidence interval from one to 5%. The most common complications were pain, a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, hematoma, and skin burn because of the heating of the um, uh, thyroid itself. Treatment efficacy, complete disappearance occurred in about 57.6%. Again, a very, very wide 95% confidence interval. And recurrence was extremely low. So obviously, oncologically, it's a, it's a very good um, option. So what are future directions? I think it would be important to study patient preferences uh, for management of papillary microcarcinomas. Do people prefer active surveillance, RFA, or surgery, and why? Clearly, there's a shifting treatment paradigm for papillary microcarcinomas, and I think it's interesting that uh, active surveillance, um, Dr. Tofana's point about active surveillance coming into vogue because of the drag of having surgery. And now that we have another option, it would be interesting to see what happens to active surveillance. And I do think that we need to remain creative and flexible, but also um, maintaining safety for our patients. So I'm reminded by Dr. Osler, who uh, uh, is from uh, Johns Hopkins, um, the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So regardless of whether the patient has a papillary microcarcinoma, if the patient is desiring active surveillance or some other treatment modality, um, I think that we need to respect what they would like to do provided that they are um, given the risks, indications, and benefits of each type of treatment. So um, to end, I'd like to circle back to that original case and see if um, anyone has a different answer after our two presentations, both by Dr. Tofano and by me. And thank you for listening. I think we'll open it up for questions at this point. Great. Um, I think that, uh, thank you, um, Ralph and Amy, that was awesome. Um, I think we're going to show the uh, poll and just see if things have changed at all. Monica, are you able to trigger that? So this was, is this our current or previous or the initial? This is the first one. Okay, and the second? The poll has been launched.
So is this the first result or the second? I'm just. This is the second. Okay, and can you? What was the first? So it looks, it appears from this that um, uh, the same number of people who were choosing radio frequency ablation has um, remained pretty stable, but the number of folks leaning towards active surveillance has gone up uh, significantly. Um, I don't know if that's a change of, of mind or um, folks who were here at the very outset when that poll was taken. Um, there are a number of questions that, again, I want to thank both presenters um, for a really concise and really outstanding presentation. I'm Mark, going to pose a few questions. Mark, that, I'm Mark, sorry. May I, just may, I may, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, with regard to radio frequency ablation for papillary microcancer or any cancer, I don't think that at this time in the United States, it should be happening outside of a research study, IRB approved study. Uh, I think what we need to make sure of is that as RFA technology becomes readily available and, our, and as people are doing uh, RFA or using RFA for benign thyroid nodules, I don't think it's just a simple transition to offer it for micro cancer. And so I just want everybody to be careful to understand that this is very nascent in that uh, some of the things that we already spoke about Yes, uh, I think it will come into play and possibly into vogue as we gain more experience. But right now, I don't want people to think that if I have an RFA generator available, I'm going to go and readily do this uh, for micro cancers. Okay. So, Ralph, um, I'm going to um, start off with a first question here. Um, and it really relates to another publication of yours this year. And it's, um, it's, it's entitled Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, Papillary Thyroid Microcarcinoma in the U.S. And in that study, um, you argue that 20% of the population of thyroid microcarcinomas in the U.S. harbor um, aggressive um, histologic features and therefore argue more in line with performing a lobectomy in order to be able to diagnose and treat appropriately. Now, this may be an issue of being able to do um, a core biopsy and get a better appreciation for what the actual histology is um, of a microcarcinoma. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. It seems like there are really two opposing thoughts and I, um, that um, I just would love, like to get your perspective. So Mark, I think in really in the absence of very sound prognostic molecular marker information. Um, this is really hard to objectify and say, what is the best treatment option? I think in the future, we are going to be able to risk stratify or prognostically stratify these micro cancers, the smaller papillary thyroid cancers into low, medium, and high risk. That would be my hope. I think the high risk ones would certainly go for surgery. I think the low risk ones that were, you know, not showing any aggressive profile, mutational profile would be great for active surveillance. And then you may have some middle ground ones that you may treat with radiofrequency or surgery. And I think that this is what we're lacking. And that's why we have all these different treatment options. I would say to you that really you're right. It is a matter of selection. And the core biopsy, I think, provides in some pathologist's hands a little bit more information to inform us about the subtype. And I think that if we see tall cell features or we see any difference in the conventional, other than the conventional papillary uh, thyroid cancer, um, then we get a little bit more worried about it. And we can't really understand how it's going to behave. So I think that bottom line is is that if you have a papillary micro cancer it's intraparenchymal on your ultrasound you're quite confident of that you trust your ultrasound you don't see any lymph node metastases the patient is euthyroid the other lobe is without any nodules there's no family history this is a perfect case for considering less is more and this may be the perfect case for either active surveillance or radiofrequency ablation. And I think we have to keep taking these cases 
as individual cases and helping the patients with our expertise, because this is what we do day in and day out, is treat patients with thyroid disease, help them make the value-based decision that's best for them. Okay, um, I'm gonna get to a couple of questions, one of which relates to exactly how steep is the learning curve to achieve zero complications after um, in performing RFA? And another question has to do with what is the, what was um, the surveillance on the patients treated with RFA in China? So let me get to the learning curve. First and foremost, you have to become facile with ultrasound. You have to do it yourself and do it on every single patient that you're seeing that you would be considering for a surgery. Obviously, they're coming to you for surgical consultation or as an endocrinologist just for evaluation. And, and so that is very critical that your ultrasound is your your ability to do that is just completely sound and and it is fundamental rudimentary second is is that i've tried every iteration of remote access surgery and i can tell you as i get older this is an incredibly challenging thing and even for me to learn transoral surgery after coming up with the vestibular approach it is very challenging. Radio frequency for somebody who does fine needle aspiration biopsies and is comfortable accessing the thyroid, it is so much simpler. And it is actually very peaceful to be able to do this. The lidocaine, you would be amazed that you're able to get the patient anesthetized very comfortably. They really permit you to do this with them not asleep. And again, I think that patient selection is critical. So if you have this intraparenchymal thyroid cancer, papillary microcancer in the lower part of the thyroid, right? Surrounded by normal parenchyma way away from the important structures. This is the perfect one to start with. I mean, I wouldn't start with a posterior capsular tumor that's in the danger triangle. I mean, we have to be prudent about this. So this learning curve for me, I've done probably about 40 uh, benign thyroid nodules with RFA and the learning curve has been exponential. And I, I, I really enjoy doing it. But again, I ultrasound every one of my patients who comes in. I've done fine needle aspiration biopsies for years, although less at this point in time. And so I feel very comfortable just adding a needle with some heat at the end to be able to visualize it under ultrasound, look for the micro bubbles, doing the moving shot technique and achieving what I'm trying to achieve with the technique. So it, it is very quick to learn. Um, I think that um, uh, Dr. Sinclair um, has a few comments. Uh, Dr. Catherine Sinclair, I think we can um, allow you to talk here. <laughs> thanks, thanks Dr. Erkin. Dr. Tafano, congratulations on the publication of this article. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see more and more publications coming out about RFA and Dr. Chen, lovely to hear your comments um, about active surveillance. Um, uh, just a couple of comments. We started our um, prospective trial around the same time, I think, as you did, Dr. Tafano, in um, August last year, along with two other centres in New York. And I would echo what you said regarding the learning curve. And it's even being proficient in ultrasound and, and proficient in biopsies, it's still a different technique and there is a learning curve for the procedure and definitely without proficiency in ultrasound and biopsies, it would be pro a technique that could potentially be quite dangerous, I think, to the patient. And so I would echo that and I think if it's something you're thinking of taking up, you definitely need to have the appropriate training before you consider taking it that one step further. Um, in this study, what I found interesting, I think, Active surveillance is active surveillance when you know it's a cancer. And I think the American Thyroid Association guidelines were done very thoughtfully um, in that we really should try not to biopsy nodules under a centimetre in size. Obviously, there are exceptions and we still do get cases where they have been biopsied. But I find that patients are very reasonable when you explain the rationale for not biopsying a nodule despite, you know, different, you know, histologic features that might make you think it's a carcinoma. And, you know, I just want to sort of uh, point out that I guess active surveillance only becomes active surveillance if we actively biopsy these subcentimeter nodules. So just having a nodule does not mean it needs treatment. And I think that's the 
the sentence that I echo 10 or 20 times a week to my patients, just because it's there, we don't have to do something about it. Um, and I think that goes for all techniques, including radio frequency. The interesting thing I found about this study was that the group of patients who perhaps are less suitable for active surveillance, those ones with aggressive histologic features, were actually the ones that were excluded from this study. Uh, we know from the active surveillance trials, which did not use core biopsy, only used fine needle biopsy, most of them, that many, you know, many of these cancers don't progress, but seven or eight percent may progress in, in some way. And the core biopsy maybe helps us um, better define what those seven or eight percent are. And I think that group of patients is the group of patients that um, would be interesting to include, actually, to see is there a difference in, you know, surgical and radiofrequency outcomes for these patients with histologically more aggressive cancers, not the ones that we know are going to do well or not, you know, pretty much universally do well because they are low risk cancers to begin with. Um, and then the final comment about this article, I, I, you know, I find it very difficult with when, when new techniques are brought out and people cite there's, a, you know, no complications, no, you know, the studies that don't examine the larynx, studies that don't do pre and post-operative laryngeal exams, really cannot cite focal cold injury rates with any um, certainty. We know that objective and subjective symptoms don't correlate well. And so I think in this article, you know, yet again, because most of the radio frequency articles to date are like this, we really don't have good objective data that vocal fold function um, is fine. And really the only way they knew about those two cases was that probably the nerve was notably injured during the surgery. Um, so I think that's something also just to take out of this. We probably still don't have really strong data about whether radio frequency is, uh, is safer than surgery. But I'm definitely finding that it's a great tech <clears throat> excuse me, technique um, for, uh, for, you know, symptomatic benign nodules, as you mentioned. Um, and I think in this country, you know, hopefully we see it being uptaken more and more, particularly as uh, hopefully in the future we get insurances to cover it. At the moment, there is no insurance coverage. So definitely even patients who have lost insurance would be looking at an out-of-pocket charge or else taking the chance with their existing insurance, some of which may pay something, but many of which will not pay. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's another consideration at the current time. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. Erkin. Yeah, yeah, thank that's you. A, that's a Go great ahead. point. The, that um, the uh, again the ultrasonographers, the radiologists performing the RFA at People's Liberation Army, uh, did not uh, look at the larynx before and after. So voice alone was used, and we know we can't use that uh, uh, absolutely to tell us how vocal fold motion and recurrent laryngeal nerve function is. And then the surgeons, their practice is not to routinely do uh, larynx evaluation before and after. So that's why. I say it still needs to be prudently studied uh, in a rigorous fashion to make sure we really understand the outcomes. So thank you. Um, thank you for your comments, Dr. Sinclair. Again, I wanna thank both presenters, Dr. Chen, Dr. Stefano. This was awesome um, and really a very enlightening conversation here. Um, with that, I have committed to, uh, on a weekly basis to have a hard stop at nine o'clock and in the interest of doing that, um, I apologize to all of the people who had sent in questions. Um, we will try our best to try and get some of those questions off to um, Dr. Tufano if, um, if we can and see if we can get them back to the, the individuals who had uh, posed them. Um, and with that, I'd like to just close this session and thank everybody for joining us and uh, hope everybody has a great weekend and stay safe. Thanks once again. Thank you, Mark. Feel free to give thank out you. my email for anybody who has any questions. Great. Terrific. Bye. Okay. Bye. You too.